Business is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, it's hard to believe we're in a brand new year once again, 215, and, or I should say 2015. But for authors, I think it's going to be a tremendous year for publishing, for positioning, for strategizing, for really connecting with whoever your potential reader is, as well as bringing them whatever is that you're doing if it's it's a if it's a fix it if it's a self help if it's a how to if it's informational if it's pure entertainment whatever it is i think this is the year with the evolution that as social media continues to evolve that town hall as, as well as other things but one of the things that we have to be careful of is the boo boos along the way the snafus the um, things that you wish that the, the traps that you would like to avoid so Today's show is really going to be focusing on the mistakes that authors typically make. And our author, our our guest today, who has been with us many times, Brett Ridgway, is the visionary behind a wonderful fulfillment service, the speakers and author fulfillment services that we like to use for warehousing as well as doing distribution fulfillment to places like Amazon and for individuals who buy um, books from our website. We just have to let them know, ship it, and get it out, and they do it very quickly. And one of the things I love about it is on the label that goes out, it actually has the name of your publishing company on the label. So it looks quite professional. So Brett Ridgway is with us today. He's the co-author of uh, Mistakes Authors Make. So we're going to learn how to avoid, I don't know if we're going to get through all 50 of them, but certainly the biggest mistakes that, that authors consistently make, especially the newbie authors, although people come back to that. Um, and, and you know, the old timers make them too. But these are some of the steps that we're going to dive into during this hour to be successful as an author. So with that, Brett, hi, welcome back. Hey, Judith, it's a pleasure to be back with you. When you called me up and asked me if I want to do the show again, naturally I said yes, because frankly, it's a lot of fun to do a show with you. So thanks <laughs> oh, for having me go. back again. <laughs> All right, so let's jump into these. You know, and I, I, I was interesting as I was going through the laundry list um, from from the new book, and and I, I actually would have put your I, – I wouldn't have put your mistake number one as 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 – the big the big number one mistake because when I know that close to eighty percent of the people think that they have a book in them, um, I, I wouldn't go along with believing you can't write a book. I probably would have jumped right into number two, writing a book for the wrong reason. So, however you numbered them, I'm not sure. But why don't we just kind of jump into this right away? Well, I think they're certainly not in any priority order necessarily, Judith. But uh, I mean, certainly a lot of people. Definitely know they have a book in them, but the thought of staring at a blank piece of paper or a blank computer screen and, and starting the writing process, frankly, scares them to death. And so they don't know how to write. So that chapter is primarily about different ways that you can write a book without actually writing a book, whether it's talking your book, getting somebody to interview you, looking at what content you've already created. So maybe you have articles you've written, blog posts you've done that you can combine into a book, hiring a ghostwriter or getting somebody, a book shepherd such as yourself, to guide somebody through the process. And so, I mean, it's not so much that people don't believe they can write a book. It's the writing process maybe scares them, and there's different ways that they can go about it other than just putting pen to paper, so to speak. Well, that's true. But number two, I think, is, as you said, more important, and that is writing a book for the wrong reason. And obviously everybody feels like they have a story to share, and they have big dreams of being a New York Times bestseller and getting the big advance and the – having the royalties rolling like crazy and they're going to sit back and they're going to become the next 
Tom Clancy or John Grisham or, or, or whoever, J.K. Rowling. And the fact of the matter is most people need to realize up front that you're really not probably going to make a ton of money on book sales directly. Does it happen from time to time? Sure, and it's great, and it's a wonderful what it does for you. But if you write the book with the thought of, hey, I'm going to become a best-selling author and I'm going to make tons of money in royalties, then you're probably writing the book for the wrong reason because, as you know, Judith, the real money in the book is using it as a lead generation device, and the money's in the back end. It's in the things beyond the book that you and I have talked about in the past that you're going to create that are higher ticket items and get people into your circle at a deeper level than just your book can't. Well, and and that's true. I, I think that, uh, and you know, going through the list, it's so I writing for the book for the wrong reason, and which which really couples in with your third uh, mistake is no real understanding of your, your target market. I have said so many times that authors, when we ask them, well, who's your book for, and they say, oh, it's for everybody, and I want to gag, gag when that comes out of their mouths, because books are never for everybody. I mean, I, I have no problem saying they are never for everybody. Um, yeah, that's and, typically the quickest route to a unsuccessful book is to think you're writing for everybody because then you can't really target your marketing appropriately and really reach the people that might really resonate with the particular mm-hmm. message that you're wanting to share. So, mm-hmm. I mean, when you're looking at you know developing a book, certainly you've got to realize that, as we said, the money's in the back end, but most people, frankly, don't give much thought up front, Judith, as to what the end game of their book is. It's like, hey, I got these thoughts in my head. I want to get it down on paper, and I throw the book out there without really thinking about that back end in advance. And you've really got to, if you're going to use your book as a lead generation device, as the entree into your funnel, then you've got to have those back end pieces into place when your book comes out, not an after the thought fact you're going to do later on down the road because. If you've got readers and you can get them to consume your book, then there are going to be great candidates to buy other products and services from you. Well, if you don't have those available for the market yet, then you're just wasting time and money. So you might make a few book sales, but you're not going to convert them into anything that will establish a deeper relationship with them other than your book. So you've got to resist the urge to, I've got my book done, I've got to throw it out in the marketplace. You got to resist doing that until you have those back end items in place where you can really convert them to a, a deeper relationship with you. Mm-hmm. And 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 supply and stuff. I mean, there's so many little goodies. I mean, you've you've already kind of opened that window. Other products. When as soon as you said that, other products. That a lot of times authors they so just think it's just one number one. They think there's only one book. And that's, that is another mistake, thinking that you only have one book, because my experience has shown with every author I've worked with, they, more books are bred. They, they just have some kind of little stepchildren that come out. Isn't that funny how that works? I mean, when I wrote my first book several years ago, it was about back of the room sales for live events. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. I've, you know, I've basically taken everything I know and put it into a book. Well, I'm done. And you, exactly. you know, we're like, well, I can write about this, and I can write about that. Mm-hmm, maybe we can do this. And then pretty soon you have more book ideas than you know what to do with. So, I mean, you've written how many now? 30, 35? So. 30, 31, and I have um, four more in process. Jeez. And and those four are spinoffs of the last book. Now, you know, the thing is, um, do you go back? Do, you know, do you go back? Am I going to write the books that, that my very first book, which was called The Woman's Guide to Financial Savvy, and it did very well. Um, am I going to go back and write that? No, because that's not who I am now. That's I'm, I'm not going to put the energy and the work into creating and building. I'm not out there doing that. And the the books I, before I just, uh, you know, started just, consulting and being the book shepherd to so many people, which I went full time in that. In 207, I'd always done a little bit sprinkling of that. But in 207, I just said, that's it. I'm done. I I don't want to travel on the road anymore. It was no longer fun to be in 12 different states in one month. I'd I'd had it. And um, that, but prior to that, you know, everything I did was tied into um, my my the business uh, my expertise which dealt with conflict resolution in the workplace especially female dominated so that's what I was writing would I write a book now on that no I wouldn't 
It's not where my heart is. Well, that's something that people don't give much thought to in advance. Is it, I mean, let's say they, they know a lot about you know baseball. So they want to write a book about baseball. That, that's great. If that's a passion and they want to write that book, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But you've got to realize that if you then want to write a book about stock trading, you've got a totally different market. So you've got to decide, are you going to build a platform and an audience in both areas? And what back to that question, what's the end game with the book? I mean, if you want to write a book just because it's a, a passion endeavor and you have a story you want to share with your family and you're going to print off a few copies and, and give it to your mom and your dad and, and your grandparents or whatever, wonderful. Go ahead and do that. But if, if the book is about building a platform and really spreading your message widely, then you need to give a lot of forethought to what that end game is in advance and not, as you talked about earlier, dude, to spread yourself so widely thinking that your book's for everybody. You've got to really hone in on that market so that – Anything you develop is really focused truly on the needs and wants of that particular market. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you talk about your mistake with the instant success, I, I think that what's important for authors to understand is uh, or, or identify, maybe it's better to say identify, what is success to them? Is it money? Is it fame? Is it having Fox or CNN or your local news call you and say, get down here, we need you right now? Um, is it having buku bucks flow into your account? What is success? And obviously that's going to vary from person to person. And as sure. you said, you got to decide yourself what success means to you. But as we all know that you know, most authors, when they develop a book, they expect it to just take off like in a whirlwind and become a, an instant international bestseller, and the fame and fortune is going to fall along quickly. You know, not realizing that most overnight successes are you know 10, 20 years in the making, and then finally they either build up enough momentum or hit a tipping point or whatever it may be. Where now, now they're a celebrity, now they're well known, now their book's a big seller because they have done all that work ahead of time. And so it mm-hmm. just doesn't happen overnight for most people. If it does for you, wonderful, fantastic, congratulations. <laughs> but, it, but it's rare. And so yeah, you've got to continually yeah. put the blocks in place to build that business so that you become that you know 10-year overnight success. <laughs> All right. Yeah. And with that, we're going to be right back. We're going to talk about some of the business of your book as well as writing your book mistakes to avoid. This is Judith Friles. It's Author You, your guide to book publishing. is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Many of us have dreamed of writing a book. Some of us even have. Then the hard work starts. You'll need an editor. Who will design the cover or typeset the pages? Who will format the ebook? If you're a business owner, consultant, or coach with a serious message and expertise to share, the team of experts at 1106 Design can guide you through the maze. They've helped more than a 1,000 authors create top-quality books and avoid the not-so-reputable self-publishing companies. Learn more at 1106design.com. Then call Michelle at 602-866-3226. 1106design. Is there a book in you or another? Author You will show you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being good with it. If you already have a book out, you'll find a supportive and brainstorming community that's connected and creative no matter where you live. Author You brings in national experts for its book camps and annual author extravaganza held each May. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author You's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publish. The Resource, its online book publishing news magazine, is content-heavy and it's free. If you want to create a book that has possessed punch and panache author you is for you if you're a hobbyist or a casual author it's not join author you today through its website at author follow author you on twitter at author you and on facebook at author you where timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted daily author you where the author goes to become seriously successful This 
is the Tokinet Radio Network. Radio with a cutting edge. First impressions are everything in the world of book publishing. Whether your book is an ebook, a print version, or both, your book cover needs to pop, sizzle, and sparkle to immediately capture the attention of your audience. And your book's interior needs to be just as dynamic and reflect the professionalism your readers demand. Nick Selinger of NZ Graphics has won numerous national and international book awards for his cover designs and interior layouts. With over 20 years of experience in graphic design, he knows what it takes to create award-winning books and the many promotional pieces that authors need, such as posters, banners, postcards, one-sheets, business cards, logos, and more. Visit ncgraphics.com and see what authors and publishers have to say about their award-winning books and how NZ Graphics can make your book the success it was meant to be. That's nzgraphics.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All right, we're talking about mistakes authors make, and um, and you don't have to be a newbie author to make mistakes. Because let me tell you, some of us old timers stumble over stuff, and I mean, one of the mistakes, and we'll get into it as we get more into the you know the development um, as we work with Brett Ridgway, the co-author of Mistakes Authors Make, and that one of the things that that I've certainly learned, and and I can see, and actually it screams to me self-published when I see it now, but is the ever-changing world of the size of a book and the preferred size, and the preferred size of a book now is a five and a half, five point five by eight and a half, or a five by eight, depending upon the size. Sometimes you'll see a five and a quarter. Um, by eight but there's variations and bookstores prefer the smaller side there's sometimes with the bigger guys the six by nine typical um, which was the norm standard uh, came into play and you'll see that with the hardback books the bigger books but there's just a little bit different variation going on so what's really important is you stay up to date on that and so that would be on one of my lists the mistakes Um, and I, i guess i would add on my mistakes um, in the very beginning, before people get started, is they don't get from the very get go that publishing is a business, Brett. It's it's it would be in the, the top five. Well, I definitely agree with that because if you think about writing a book, and as we said, if your thought is about just sharing your story with a family, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. But most people don't think about all the hats you need to wear if you're going to be an author. And you've got to decide which of those hats you're going to wear. And all those hats involve some aspect of you know, your book being a business, as you said, whether you're going to be an editor, a proofreader, whether you're going to be the copywriter, whether you're going to be the, you know, gosh, uh, copy editor, whether you're going to be I mean, there, there's what, you know, 10, 12 hats you got to wear as an author just in the book writing process alone, much less when you get into the phase of, okay, now I need to be a marketer of my book, and am I going to develop my own website? Am I going to contract that out? Am I going to do my own shipping? Am I going to be my own, you know, travel agent? Am I going to be my, am I going to become a speaker and go out and try to sell books by being on platforms? Well, who's arranging my speaking gigs? I mean, it just goes on and on and on, and truly it is a business, and you've got to decide which hats you're going to wear which hats you should outsource or get help with. And if you think of it as a hobby, then you're going you're gonna to fail, frankly. You're not going to succeed. So you've got to treat it as a business if you truly want to build a platform and spread your message to a wider audience in the world. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the ones I, I love to shout out to uh, is uh, client, my client Steve Snyder with his book called Shutdown. The, the true story of Captain Howard Snyder and the crew of the B-17 Susan Ruth, and they were shot down yeah, over Belgium. Book. I actually read that one from cover to cover. Well, thank you very much. Well, if their producers are talking to them now. Um, cool. and, and, and he, but he pre-sold, he's worked his tush off. He, he's, if I would have one of my ideal clients, and I had several wonderful clients I've worked with this past year, he would be in that top three. 
and mm -hmm. he has really worked and been focused and got it from the get-go. And he had almost 500 pre-sales on Amazon before we, we even opened the floodgates on that. And he's getting ready to go back to second print. Another ideal author was Lisa Cartelli with her fabulous memoir, Heart of Fire, which was about she is a little girl who's playing hide-and-go-seek with her grandma um, in the basement, and the whole house blew up. And, you know, extensive burns and, and what she's done in her own recovery, but it, she does with other uh, people who have gone through burn trauma and especially girls and things. And she is already back within two months to her, her next printing, which is very exciting. Um, but she has also embraced it very quickly. This is a business. And it, if it's going to be, it is up to me, which I think is a very good motto. Brett, for yeah, authors that, that, to get. That should, been, that should have been what I titled, uh, I forget, what one of the chapters, but it definitely applies to that. You know, thinking you're going to do it all yourself. Because certainly mm. most of it's going to fall on you. And if you expect other people to go out there and, and do all your marketing for you, it, it really isn't going to happen. You know, you got to be the one driving the cart. you got to be the one piloting the engine. And they've done a great job on that, and they're showing the success as a result of it, obviously. Oh, yeah. I mean, and they're, they they have plans. I mean, it's ongoing. I think one of the things that authors need to understand in the, 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 the business side, which incorporates you start thinking marketing from the get-go, is that – and it's the, really the true beauty of being a self or an indie pub publisher now, an author in that area, is that – it, it, it you can embrace and put into play what I call the the rolling launch. You can continue to launch and relaunch your book and keep pulling it out there as you you go in and you expand and you roll into it. Going back to Steve Snyder, he he got from the get go that you know it's this is a World War II book. There are people who are very interested in military related history that and and one of his natural sites is every time he shows up at any type of a museum um, and military based he sells out he sells out now, I want that a phrase again Judith if it's to be it will be me was that it if if it's if it's to be it's up to me. It's up to me. All right, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to borrow that with due credit. <laughs> you may. I, I think you know what. I think I'll make a poster. You know, I, I make posters all the time um, as we go on. Let Let's jump into because um, uh, you have several sections. What I like about the book is it's broken up in sections. You know, before you write the business of your book, the writing of your book, etc. Let's Let's play around a little bit more with the business because you do talk about um, literary agents in here. And do you need one? And and what happens if you use one when you don't need one? So, can you? Why don't you expand a little bit on that? Well, certainly one of the things as an author you've got to decide is how you're going to get the message about your book out to the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you want to sell it to a traditional publisher, then as you know, Judith, most of them, frankly, just want to deal with literary agents, and your ability to go to them directly is challenging at best. And so, if you're traditional publishing. You may be forced to find a literary agent because that's the only way that the big publishers are even going to listen to you. Now, if you decide you want to self-publish, then you you know you don't need a literary agent. Why go giving them a cut of your money because you know they're going to do nothing for you under that scenario? So you've got to give a lot of thought in advance to do you want to self-publish? Do you want a traditional publish? Do you want a hybrid publish? Do you want a vanity publish? And all of them have their pros and their cons. There's not necessarily a right answer. You've got to decide what fits you. Mm -hmm. But in certain worlds, just the way it's been structured over time is the way you reach those people is via literary agent. And so if that's the route you choose to go, then that's the parameters that you need to work within. And, I, I mean, I frankly – you know a lot more about this than I do, Judith. I've never worked with a literary agent. I know some of them. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, what do you see as, as the pros and cons in this arena? I'd I, I, I love your two cents on this. Well, I've – you know, I've been represented by some of the best, like William Morris – on that, and I have to say that William Morris got me into the worst contract I've ever been in in my life. Well, actually, I, I got myself into a bad contract too but <laughs> when I did it myself. But um, they they have it, it. It has been a nightmare for me, uh, and it's still out there. And I remember going to them saying, "For God's sakes, get me out of this!" And or, or no, what they said to me is, "Is you know these people are crooks." And I said, "No fooling." 
And, and I said, get me out of this, Nell. And he, he says, well, if you decide to sue, we certainly will support you and testify for you. And I said, oh, for God's sakes. Um, and then I knew that I would probably be getting a divorce from them. So that uh, I think that if you've got a good literary agent, a literary agent should be, number one, bring more to the, pay, the, the party and the table than what you can do. And, and they should be in there to protect you. You don't want one just going to check off this and boilerplate didn't pick up your 15 percent or whatever the percentage is that they're taking um, in, in today's in, in that area. So you want someone who will really go through it and look for it. You want to make sure that your literary agent has in a reversion of rights uh, clause, which has been taken out almost of every contract I've seen in the last couple of years. And the reversion of rights used to be is that, you know, the book's basically out of print and, um, you know, it's been, it's been lovely, but, you know, it's over and you have the rights back to your book. Well, today's publisher doesn't do that anymore. And a good literary agent should make sure that that's in there. And I would put in that in the clause that if the book doesn't sell more than 500 or 300 copies, print print, 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 within a year, you have the right, you have the right uh, to get it back. And, and an agent should be going through and on your behalf to protect you. They're not working for the publisher. So that's, and it's also, I think, really good for an agent is they get to be the bad guy. It allows you to be the good guy. So if you're upset or feeling pissy about something, you let that agent know and they get to to harangue the publisher or the editor and you stay out of the fray. I think that's one of the most important things that they have into play. If it doesn't work, well, Brett, I think you have to get out of it. Well, I know with the advent of all the new print-on-demand technologies over the last few years, a lot of publishers, mm. quote, in their mind, never take your book out of print because they yes, can go print exactly. on demand or whatever. So how, how, yeah. how do you battle that particular argument oh, well, from these publishers? That's what that's that's what I would put in that it's out. It, it uh, if it only sells three hundred copies in a year, for example, um, in the old days that book would have been considered dead. If it only sells 300 copies, that you have the right, and it's not mutually agreed. Don't sign a contract that says mutually agreed. What's that about? Um, and then you have the right to pull it back. Otherwise, they keep you there in perpetuity, and I don't want to see that happen. We're going to have more. Brett Ridgway is my guest. We're talking about mistakes authors make. It's Author You, your guide to book publishing. is your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles and we'll be right back with more great information right after these since 1987 color house graphics has set the standard for quality book production whether you decide to print a small quantity of books or need a large print run depend on color house to help you you'll receive professional help and advice the moment you reach one of our representatives if you mention hearing about us on your guide to book publishing, Judith Bryles, we will provide you with discount on the first order you place. To speak with a project manager, call us toll free at 800-454-1916 or visit us at www.colorhousegraphics.com. Ned Thompson and Harry Shore started Thompson Shore in 1972. They believed employees with great character would make up the best company. They were right. They hired people who were not only experts in bookmaking, but who were obsessed with quality and delivering exceptional customer service. Almost 40 years later, Thompson Shore remains a 100% employee-owned company. Ned and Harry knew that successful customer projects are a direct result of empowered employees. We specialize in all books for large and small publishers. Creating beautiful and well-made books, we're dedicated to pleasing our customers by making the experience a good one from start to finish. The personal touch we have with our customers 
allows us to be innovative in solving their most difficult challenges. Our platform also ensures that we can remain flexible to meet our customers' unique needs and expectations. Our marketing kit can create buzz for your title, enhancing the promotion of your book during infancy. When you need to test the market to gauge your future sales, we can provide digitally printed books that will transition seamlessly into a larger offset run. From ebook to hard copy to delivery, our skillful customer service teams are at the ready to answer your most pressing question. At Thompson Shore, we know that making the highest quality books requires more than just best technologies. It requires superior customer service, professionalism to the trade, and commitment to environmental and social values. With these standards of excellence in place, you can be sure that we will always help you put your best book forward. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Wowzer, I've got to make this announcement before we jump into this again. But, you know, we are just, just a week away from the closeout on the Drafted Dream book competition. And uh, four amazing authors are going to get close to a $10,000 package. They're not going to be sold anything else. It's just they, they're going to get an editor. They're going to get a cover designer. They're going to get an interior designer. They're going to get, uh, they've got global distribution from uh, Ingram, which is fabulous. They're getting their ebooks done. They're getting a full pitch uh, spiel to all the libraries in the country. They're going to get a couple hours with me. They're going to be able to attend the author you extravagant. Ganza, May 7th through 9th, um, and there's so much more. Four people are going to walk away with that. Why not you? If you go to authoru.org, just click on the icon that says the Draft to Dream Book Competition and get registers pronto, and we don't need to see. It's not a finished book. It's a, your draft, and, and who are your judges? librarians, the people who will bring it in. They understand some books are in progress, but heck, for $100, I'd sure take advantage of it because you are taking a, a huge step in moving that direction. So that's the Draft to Dream book competition. Everything's on the authoru.org website um, and plan to come to Denver in May and find out who the big winner is. Okay, Brett. And if you haven't been to Author you get yourself there. Judith puts on a wonderful Thank event. You. I've had the pleasure to attend it two or three times, and she takes care of her folks, and she has a lot of great teachers there for you. And frankly, you'll advance further as an author by getting out to live events and networking and meeting people. I mean, your, your best affiliates, your best joint venture partners, your best guides will be the people you've established personal relationships. So get yourself to Author you and start making those connections. Yeah, and I guess I should say that um, a lot of my experts that I have on this program are there. They're speaking. They're exhibiting. If they have services, our printers are all there. Um, Brett is there and gives you a chance to see because he has some amazing other products that are very cool um, that you can see. And and it, it's, just, it's just really it's a fun event. And I'm so excited, Brett, because I have tracked down – a person who has written a book um, and is an expert in creating short talks and TED Talks. And I actually met her at a conference two years ago in, in the hallway by the elevator. <laughs> and ended up huh. sitting down and talking with her for an hour. And she is yeah, going really, to be here. It's interesting to me, Judith, how the cachet of being a, a TED presenter really oh, it's huge. has taken hold. Oh, it's huge. And you know what? Corporations are designing their programs now based around that short talk, that TED mm-hmm. Talk. And, and, and there's a lot of things, nuances in doing a short talk that are so different from doing a keynote that's an hour or from a workshop that could be a couple hours to all day. They're, it's huge. And just learning the tricks of the trade and how to do it, I'm very excited. I'm so excited that she's coming. So. Here we so go. Are we going to see a mini Ted Forbat at Author U at some point in time then? Um, we, we, we could do some sampling. There might be a sampling <laughs> sometime next year. How's that? Next year, sampling. 
<laughs> and we can create that. All right. So we talked about not using a litter agent and using one when you don't need one. And you know, let me just let me just add on to that because do you need one if you um, are if you're dealing with a, a New York and those kind of publishers? I would say uh, you would be smart to have one. Um, and then secondly, if you're, if you're doing it yourself, I, I don't see why you would doing it. If you're, if you're jumping into bed with a pay to publish operation or, or there's a lot of these people who say they're publishers and they really aren't, you're paying them for those services and you need to get that, um, that, that what you need to do is probably have a literary attorney, make sure that. You, some, he goes through that or she goes through your contract before you sign your life away. So just that would be my advice on that whole thing, Brett. Well, right. you, you've you lived it, so I, I respect your advice wholeheartedly. <laughs> uh, I, I do. Okay, so you know one of you things you had on your mistakes is not understanding how bookstores work. So what's the latest and greatest with the bookstore land? Well, I mean, as we all know, Judith, bookstores – seem to be going the way of the dinosaur, so it, it's becoming less and less of a factor over time. Is it going to go away entirely? Of course not. I mean, bookstores will always remain around. But there's very few players on a massive national scale in the bookstore market now. you got, you know, Barnes & Nobles, and you got Books A Million, and, mm-hmm. you know, that's almost it in terms of large retailers just in the book genre. Mm-hmm. And if you want to sell to those people, then you're going to be having to deal with somebody at a corporate level because you're not going to walk usually into your local national chain and make a deal to sell your book. Now, as a local author, that can happen sometimes, certainly. Mm-hmm. But that's you know getting yourself into one bar of the noble or one books a million, which is wonderful, but obviously not going to probably sell a lot of books for you and spread the word. So if you want to get into the national chain, that means you need to deal with somebody that's reaching those people on a regular basis and whether that's working through a distributor or getting uh, you know in tight with Ingram where they're really pushing your book or getting your publisher truly on your side helping you immensely with your publishing I mean it's back to what you said to a large extent yourself Judith I mean if it's if it's going to be it's up to me and you just got to recognize that in the traditional bookstore your ability to reach directly on a wide scale into all their operations isn't really there. I mean, it's not feasible to do. So how are you going to get to the corporate folks? And you got to decide that through a distributor or some other way where you're going to be able to reach them yourself and sell at a corporate level. Now, certainly your mom-and-pop bookstores is a different deal, and you can go in and, and make relationships with them. But again, that's not going to move a lot of books for you. So it's, it's a matter of figuring out the ins and outs of how to reach the true buyers for those operations because, I mean, a Barnes & Noble is going to have, what, dozens of different buyers and different genres and all that. So how do you identify the right person and how do you get into those places? And mm-hmm. well, you know, I, I, you know, for, This is going to be one of those things where, Judith, I'm sure you've forgotten more about than I know. So I, Yeah, well, I, I can just add on. There is a very – and there for the small press division, Barnes & Noble has a, a entity called the small press division. And I, I know well the woman who runs it. So what I do is I introduce them. I introduce my authors to them to get picked up at BNN. And that, but you got to have, let me tell you, you got to have a marketing plan because they are, no one's interested, as well as a major um, uh, wholesaler like Baker and Taylor or Ingram. They are not interested in you unless you have a game plan to get people to get their tushes into the bookstore and buy your book. And if you can't verbalize that in written, you know, in writing that this is what you're going to do, blah, 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 blah. They're going to go pass. I'm just going to tell you it's going to happen. The second thing is for a, for a major chain like books, a million, uh, Barnes and Noble, that you've got to have, you do have to have that national wholesaler distributor there that a bookstore can contact. And they're going to ask, they're going to demand the same thing. So you need to know that indie bookstores are a little bit different. Um, and they're a little bit more flexible, 
and uh, and work with you. Now, one of the great things, there is something called Indie Bound, and the indie bookstores do shout out to each other and talk to each other. So if you hit it big in an indie store, and there are, you know, there are games we authors can play, but there are strategies you can do in driving people there and doing events tied in with them, or even you do private events and you bring the books in from those stores, that if you start moving those books, they start talking you up to other people. And that that's a strategy. But Brett's right. A mistake is not knowing how bookstores, usually being in a bookstore means your ego needs you there. Really, there are other ways to sell books. So, Well, just to piggyback on something you said, Judith, you talk about the relationship you have with somebody that you introduce your authors to in the small press division. Yes. You know, for Ingram. I mean, it's about personal relationships again. It's people that you have established connections with that then can help you and you can leverage to help your people. So that's why you've got to get out there and meet people at events and get to know the industry and know who the movers and the shakers are because having a personal relationship with somebody who's in a position of authority will serve you well. And if you expect you're just going to sit behind your computer, you know, pick up the phone and call a few people or shoot off a few emails and really establish rapports and extend your reach, you're just kidding yourself. Exactly. It, it, that, that's uh, that's so so true. It, it is, and that's why I'm going to go back to what you said as we started this this segment. That coming to authoru dot org, the extravaganza May seventh through ninth this year. Um, you want to be there because a lot of those people can make it happen. Because guess who's going to Ingram will be there. We're, they're one of our sponsors this year. They will be there. Wouldn't you just cool. love to talk to the direct manager of it? I would. I would. <laughs> so. Well, there's a connection I'll be looking to make when I'm in Denver this summer. Hot, hot, hot spit, huh? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You you have some things. I'm, I'm jumping around here, but you have an intersection on writing your book. I, I, I have to tell you, I love mistake number 20, and it is writing a crappy book. <laughs> so, Brett, add to that. What were you thinking? Well, I mean, one of the things that I think people – do is they just oh, what's the word I'm looking for? You know, a brain dump, or, or mm-hmm. there's no real thought as to how mm-hmm. to structure your information to truly benefit the end reader. And so you just throw anything down in any order. Don't edit it. Don't clean it up. Don't make the oh. layout look nice. I mean, there's so many little things that, frankly, make your book not consumable. And your book is all about readability slash consumption. And so you've got to think in advance when you're writing that book. What am I going to do to have people most easily read my book? Because as we talked about, if you have back-end products and services that your book is designed to lead people to, well, if they won't even read your book because it's a piece of crap, then your chances of selling them other things is, is you know disappears entirely. Mm-hmm. I mean you want to put out a good book. It doesn't need to be perfect, obviously. But I've been involved with projects for people where – I mean, for example, we had one person who insisted on dotting every I and crossing every T 16 times. And oh. a product that should have been in the market in January ended up not getting out to the market till June or July. And it just killed okay. the m- momentum of the project. Brett, hold the that thought because we're going to come back I to will that. Hold that, that thought. That's an important thing to, to tap into. This is Judith Bryles. My guest is Brett Ridgway. He's the author, the, uh, a co author of, of Mistakes Authors Make. We'll be right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and a guide to partner with you as you create, strategize, develop, publish, and achieve your publishing goals. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so, or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand, and is a financial success, a bestseller. It's your choice. You choose. You need the book shepherd. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You don't need problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Bryles will shepherd you through the maze and the chaos. At times, she's had to step in and rescue a book, a book that has been sabotaged by a publisher or by a publishing service provider or sometimes even the author themselves. Judith Bryles is the book shepherd if you want to create a book with no regrets. Give her a call today, 303 
303-885-2207. That's 303-885-2207. Or email her at judith at bryles.com. By the way, Bryles is spelled B-R-I-L-E-S. Follow Judith on Twitter at My Book Shepherd and on Facebook at The Book Shepherd. With quality programming, this is Tokinet Radio. At Total Printing Systems, customer service is our priority. We are located in Southern Illinois. Our employees have an average of 18 years' experience and know that customer relationships are important to our continued success. We have been a short-run book printer for nearly 40 years and always stay at the forefront of technology. Our niche is from 1 to 5,000 copies. Today, we offer digital black and white and four-color high-speed inkjet printing, a cost-effective way to introduce color into your short-run titles. We, of course, offer traditional offset printing as well. Bindery is done in-house, from adhesive case binding to PUR perfect binding to mechanical binding of all types, including side sewing. We provide warehousing, kitting, distribution, inventory management, a new print-on-demand facility, streaming browser-based ebooks, and bookstore. Call us at 1-800-465-5200 for a quote on your next book project. You can also visit our website at www.tps1.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. All righty. With me is Britt Ridgway. He is the co-author of Mistakes Authors Make. Learn how to avoid the 50 biggest mistakes authors make. And uh, we, we can't go through all 50 of them, but we are tap dancing through them. So one of the ones in, in writing your book, I mean, we both agree about the, the crappy book. We see too many of them. I, I told Britt um, before we started that there, I just, there, there's too many books that what I would call book pollution because it's so easy. Anybody can produce it. Um, one of his mistakes is in this, this section on writing your book, I think which is really important, is if some people think, well, I'm just going to do an ebook, um, ebook only, and they don't think about the print. And you can do a there, there's ways to do print very quickly and, and effectively. Is that not true, Brett? Well, there certainly is. And I mean, with the advent of Create Space and 48 hour books and Lulu and all that. I mean, you don't need to commit to getting tons of books printed up front. One of the mistakes I think authors make is they they get hung up on the per unit cost of producing their book. So they're more concerned about the printing cost of the book than how many books they can sell. Mm -hmm. And so they go order 5,000 of a book or whatever. And in fact, let me tell you a horror story, Judith. We have a a client from Australia, and I won't name the name to protect the innocent. (laughs) Wrote a wonderful cookbook, had 5,000 of them printed up full color, and shipped them to her warehouse. I got 15 pallets in. This has been like four years uh, ago. Uh, I still have 15 pallets sitting in my warehouse. I mean, they had to have laid out $10,000, $20,000 up front to print all these books, and they didn't have a marketing channel in place to really move the books yet, but to be, they got much better price because they had so many printed, so they had that many printed up front. It was just a disaster in my opinion. So mm-hmm. don't get hung up on the per unit cost. Make sure your marketing is working first, and then you can order higher volume levels as you build your marketing up. But with the advent of print on demand these days, you don't have to commit to a bunch of books up front. Get your marketing going. Spend a little bit more per copy, and then just do them up as you need them, whether it's 50, 100, 500 at a time. You don't need to do thousands at a time. Right, and, and you know, and the exception will be if you've got your game plan in play and doing that, then go ahead and do that. But uh, do the bigger print runs, which a lot of our clients, you know, because I make them do marketing plans, but that you'll you'll have that in play, and you're going to be moving them in your strategy, and you're committed on the long term. Remember, publishing is a marathon; it's not a sprint. 
So you, you have a, a couple of the points I wanted to come back to is that uh, you talk about your mistake number 25 is no name capture mechanisms built into your book. So explain, uh, explain about that a little bit. Well, when somebody buys your book, Judith, on Amazon or even in your local bookstore, do they pick up the phone and call you and tell you that Joe Blow bought your book? Well, of course they don't. So if you are using your book as a front-end product to hopefully sell them additional products and or services, Mm -hmm. how are you going to drive them from that book to you? Mm -hmm. Are you going to hope that they search and find you online? Well, that's probably not going to happen. So you've got to build into your book ways to draw them to your website so you can capture their name and email address to then market them additional things. And so whether that's, you know, one per chapter or scattered throughout the book, what can you offer to people as a ethical bribe to come to your website, opt in, in other words, give you their name and email address in order to receive something in exchange? Maybe it's a bonus report. Maybe it's an audio. Maybe it's a video. Whatever it may be. It doesn't really matter. Obviously, the content needs to be related to the content of your book, but these are things you've got to develop and design into your book up front so that hopefully you can capture that buyer that buys your book online at Amazon or buys your book at the local Barnes & Noble so that then you can then market them other things. So you've got to build name capture into your product. It's, it's a given, and most people don't think about it ahead of time, and it's a big mistake when you don't. You know, I had a discussion similar to that because I was I, I was working on a nonfiction book with a client and um, referring back to her firm or some examples that they have done in the transition and change that they've done. And, and um, she ended up whipping it all out because they thought it was two sales. And I said, but that's what the purpose of your book is. It's to establish your credibility and that and if you're saying this is how we work this through and tie it into that. I don't feel you're directly getting into their face and saying, you know, you've got two minutes to get this for (laughs) $9.99. And and I I couldn't get her to to keep that in. And I think it lost some of uh, really some good content that they pulled out in their, some of their examples. All right. So you also talk about in your, um, uh, you had a, a couple of their goodies in here. I wanted to tap on to, for example, um, and this really does tie into what you're just saying, no list building efforts. So where would you put a list building effort? Is that what you're referring back to, to capture? Well, I mean that in that particular situation, Judith, that's going to be an after the publication event where you're going to continue okay. to build your list and market. But mm-hmm. you should really be building your list in advance of publication of your book so that you have a ready audience of people that you can sell your book to when it's available. I mean, you mentioned your author Steve Snyder of the book Shot Down, mm-hmm. who did a wonderful mm-hmm. job getting pre-orders of his book on Amazon. So he Mm -hmm. had 500 books already sold before it was even printed, basically. That's outstanding. But he was able to do that by building the list and communicating with people in advance of publication. So if your book isn't ready, what can you do to get people to basically opt in and want to be notified when your book is ready? So come up. Again, it's the same type of thing you might include in your book to drive them to your website after they purchase some of those things may be a before the book type thing where you're putting out, you know, your advertising online or whatever you're doing to drive people to website. So, you know, come get my special report and then, you know, when the book's out, we'll tell you type thing. So you're starting to build a list before your book is available so that when it, that magic date comes and it's available for purchase, you have people ready to step up to the plate and buy it now. Mm-hmm. So that you way, if you want to do an Amazon bestseller campaign or something, you can make okay. that happen because you've got a list already established of people ready to buy your book. You know, and then here's another thing. There's a post. You do that post as well because there, you may have certain tools. If you're doing nonfiction, you may have certain tools within your book where you could create them. And I know that in my Author You book, um, creating and building your author and book platforms is that there I go into the extensively into why you need a game plan. And when I teach, uh, I do a three-day event with just me every August, which is called the Judith Bryles uh, Book Publishing Unplugged. <laughs> and the, um, and we, we have that, and I, I have big four-by-two uh, maps, I mean, li- literally that they 
tape up duct tape up onto the walls that they work on during those three days. And I'm going to take that and write a special upsell report, just to talk about with the game plan and how you use it and do it. And we're just going to put it up for 10 bucks, just only 10 bucks. And I think we'll sell probably quite a few of them. Yeah, I mean, those ancillary products are, are great for both list building tools in advance of publication of the book and after the fact bonuses. And you got to decide which is going to fit where appropriately. And I love your idea about the big maps. And I mean, people love checklists. Anything how to that step by step that you can provide mm-hmm. really excites people. I mean, resources excite people. If you ever go to a live event, you ever notice, Judith, how the crowd seems to really pop up when a speaker says, and the resource I recommend for this, and then everybody's ears perk up, and they want to know who that resource is. Exactly. Yep. And that yep. really catches people's attention. So resources yep. are, are wonderful things that you can utilize in some way to mm-hmm. help people mm-hmm. you know, feel more love for you and, and want to be in your circle so that when that book comes out, they're ready buyers. Exactly. You know, I have to share with you, um, and God, we're, we only have three minutes to go here, but uh, that I started for this new year on the Book Shepherd um, website, the, that my personal website, that what I did, whoops, I, I didn't turn my phone off before I started this, on my Book Shepherd <laughs> website, that um, I started the Kick Butt, Kick Butt um, Author and Publishing Tips ahas. And um, I'm actually giving anywhere from, you know, two to three of those kind of resources, tips, just quick tips. Here's what it is. Here's how to use it. Here's the link to go get it. Go, 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 go. And, and that I'm doing that on Saturday mornings now that that blog goes out. And, and that's kind of fun. All right. So we're, we're, we've got two minutes. Um, one of the goodies that you talked about was the, the communication, that not continuing to, to uh, no ongoing commitment to market, but also the communication side. So if you can tap on this, you have to do it really fast, Brett. <laughs> sure. Well, we could ha- summarize this in two senses. It doesn't ah. build any sense, make any sense to build a list if you're going to let the list go cold. So you've got to make sure those people that opted in nine months ago, six months ago, to be notified of when your book's going to be ready are still feeling warm and fuzzy to you. So make sure you communicate with them. Continue to give them great tips, techniques, whatever it may be, so that they're feeling even better about you. So when the book's ready to go, they're ready to buy. So, and you, you're going to do that with your own direct emails, but you know, also use your your Twitter accounts or wherever you need to understand the social media platform um, that your tribe is going to follow. Um, and it's very important to do that, and and then you have them. And of course, on your website, you're going to make sure you have all those commitments so they can immediately connect with you that way, and and then you can stay informed. All right, Brett Ridgeway. We're, we're going to have to come back because obviously we have a lot more mistakes we can deep dive into. So we'll do another show. But congratulations well, on your new it. book. I hope we share some things that will help folks out today. I think yep. uh, Brian got the site up today. So check out mistakesauthorsmake.com and uh, Wonderful. to your library. Okay, mistakesauthorsmake.com. You can find it on Amazon. So go get it. And we will be back with you next week with a lot more on Author You, Your Guide to Book Publishing. Happy New Year to everyone. Stay warm if you're in the, uh, like Colorado, where it's cold and where Brett is in his neck of the woods. But it's uh, it's going to get warmer. And we are moving now <laughs> towards spring and then summer. So there we go. All right. Thank you, Brett. Take care, everyone. It's a great day for to be an author. a part of your guide to book publishing everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host dr judith briles each week